In this video, we're going to talk about intermolecular forces. The inter part of that word means between, so the forces between molecules, so two or more molecules of the, the same thing. So when we talk about those, I'm going to call them IMF, so we don't have to say that too much. And when you have different molecules, they have different forces that act between them, so we're going to learn about why that is the case. Those forces control a lot of their physical properties. I think you remember when we talked about melting point, when we talked about types of bonding, that we talked about these forces between molecules when we talked about covalent compounds. So melting point, boiling point, how soluble something is in water or other substances, viscosity, you may or may not be familiar with that term. When we talk about viscosity, people tend to think about like how thick something is. So something like honey has a higher viscosity than water. Mayonnaise has a very high viscosity. Um, it's the resistance to flow. And then there's surface tension. Uh, surface tension, you may have looked at this in another science class when you see how many drops of water you can put on a penny. Uh, many people are really surprised by that because what happens is when you start putting the drops on the penny, the water kind of bubbles up and it makes a little spherical shape on top of the penny and it holds the uh, surface of that water on there. You can get a lot of drops of water on a penny. So ask your friends if they've done that if you haven't. Uh, there are three main IMFs that you're going to need to understand for this class. There are dipole-dipole forces, not dipole, dipole. There are hydrogen bonding intermolecular forces, and then there are London dispersion forces. We call those LDFs. We're going to start off by talking about dipole-dipole forces. Dipole-dipole forces, if you can remember back to periodic trends, we talked about electronegativity. And that's the ability of an atom in a compound to attract electrons to itself. Think about where the elements are on the periodic table that have the highest electronegativities. If you look at the periodic table, the upper right hand corner, fluorine actually has the highest electronegativity. And the electrons in a compound will spend more time around the more electromagnetic, uh, the more electronegative atoms than they will around the other atoms. So if you have a compound that has fluorine in it, those electrons are more attracted to it than they are to the other atoms. And so if that's happening, you've got electrons spending more time around a particular atom, how will that atom be different? So think about electrons. They have a negative charge. And so those electrons are going to be more negative. Those electrons don't stay on that atom, but they spend more time close to it because they're attracted to it. So it doesn't really get a full negative charge, but actually a partial negative charge. And we call that a delta minus. That's a Greek letter, lowercase delta. And it looks to me kind of like a musical note. I just write it like a funny little D with a loopy thing at the top. Um, but when we look at that, let's look at a compound that uh, has a dipole-dipole. So when you look at hydrofluoric acid, it's just hydrogen and fluorine bonded. And you can see that that red end is where the fluorine atom is, and more that the electron from the hydrogen is attracted to that fluorine, and so it spends more time around it, making it a little bit more negative. The blue end is the hydrogen end, it becomes slightly more positive. And you can see that little arrow, you're not going to really need to understand that. This is a math thing when we talk about dipole moments. But you can see that it has two poles. It has a positive pole and a negative pole. That's where the term dipole comes from. When we talk about dipole-dipole, we're talking about more than one molecule that has a dipole. So intermolecular forces between more than one molecule. All right, so when we talk about something that has dipole-dipole intermolecular forces, we're talking about something that we say is polar. And you may have heard that term in biology or in an earlier science class. So that difference in charge is called a dipole. And so one end of the molecule is somewhat positive while the other end is somewhat negative. So let's think about now how that causes uh, molecules to interact. We know that positives and negatives are opposites and they attract. And then like things, like charges, two positives or two negatives will repel. And so when we have 
two molecules lined up together, obviously the negative end of one will be attracted to the positive end of the other. And if you look at a whole bunch of molecules together, you can see the red lines there show you the attractions between the molecules, between the positive end of one molecule and the negative end of another. And those dotted blue lines show you the repulsion. So when there are two negatives or two positives close together, they're repelling each other. And what happens with those molecules is they will set themselves up so that the attractions predominate. So the molecules will keep moving around until those attractions predominate. So let's talk about how we can tell whether a molecule has dipole-dipole forces. When we see molecular shapes that have uneven placement of atoms, so pause for a minute, look back at your notes from the um, Lewis structures and see if you can figure out which shapes those might be. Okay, so let's look at this together. If you notice the bent shape has that central atom but then two atoms that are placed off center, so that would be an uneven shape. And then hopefully you recognize that trigonal pyramidal has the uneven placement because it's got that one central molecule and the three going away, but it's got all that empty space on the top. The other thing that can happen is when you have a shape that is not uneven, that's a regular shape, but it has different types of atoms around the outside. So if you have something that has carbon in the middle and three hydrogens around the outside and one fluorine, so CH3F, fluorine would be pulling those electrons to it and it would pull them away from the hydrogens and the carbon. So that would cause it to have that uneven placement even though it would have a tetrahedral shape. So you just have to know which shapes have the dipole-dipole, and then the fact that even the other shapes can have dipole-dipole if they have different atoms around the outside. So now that we've talked about the shapes to determine whether a molecule is polar or not, remember that polar means that it has dipole-dipole intramolecular forces, Let's look at a few common molecules and talk about whether or not they are polar or not. So let's look at carbon dioxide. Pause the video. You know the formula for carbon dioxide. Draw the Lewis structure and then come back and we'll look at it together. All right, so let's try doing a quick Lewis structure. Hopefully you recognize that the formula for carbon dioxide is CO2. So from carbon, one atom, and there are four valence electrons, so that gives me a total of four. With oxygen, there are two atoms. There are six valence electrons in each of those, which is 12. And that gives me a total of 16. I'm not gonna go through all of the iterations, but what you should have ended up with is carbon with double bonds to oxygen, that would be eight electrons, and that would leave me with eight, and then I would put two pairs on each of those oxygens. So that's what your Lewis structure should look like. So think about now what the shape would be. It has two shared pairs of electrons on that central atom, no unshared pairs, so that would be a linear shape. So remember to think about the central atom in terms of shared and unshared pairs when you're trying to figure out that shape. So let's look at a different picture of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide has the carbon in the middle and the oxygen's on the end, same atoms around the end, and a linear shape, which is not one of our shapes that has dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. So carbon dioxide is not polar, all right? Let's look at another one. Carbon tetrafluoride, again, pause, do the Lewis structure and the shape for this, and then we'll come back to it. All right, so hopefully you know that the formula for carbon tetrafluoride is CF4. So you've got one carbon atom with four electrons, four valence electrons, so there's a total of four there. With fluorine, we have four atoms, and each of those has seven.
and that gives us a total of 28. When we add that up, we've got 32. We're going to use carbon as our central atom. We're going to hook all those fluorines onto it. Remember to follow all the steps with the Lua structures so that you get the correct answer. Now we've used 8 in our bonds, and when we subtract 8 from 32, that gives us 24. In order to make a full octet on these outside atoms, they have two in the shared pair, so we need to give each fluorine six more. So if we do that, we're going to end up using, that's a little blip there, sorry. You're going to end up using the all of those extra electrons. Now remember to ask yourself before the next step, we've used all the electrons, does carbon have a full octet? If it doesn't, that's when you need to go back and do that double bond. Carbon does have a full octet in this case, so this is the correct Lewis structure. Now remember, shared and unshared pairs, it's got four shared and zero unshared pairs. So hopefully you recognize that this shape is tetrahedral. Tetrahedral is not one of the shapes that has dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. And because each of these atoms is the same, all fluorines, they're all going to be pulling equally. I'll show you that picture in a minute. But that is not a shape that has dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. Now, if one of these fluorines were changed to another atom, like chlorine or hydrogen, then that would be that uneven placement of atoms where you have more than one type around the outside. That would have dipole-dipole, but carbon tetrafluoride does not. So let's look at our picture. And if you see this little picture here, you can see you've got the central carbon, and then you've got those uh, fluorines each just kind of pulling equally, almost like a tug of war. So carbon tetrafluoride is not polar. All right, let's do the Lewis structure for water. Pause and try that. I'm pretty sure all of you remember the uh, formula for water, H2O. So you've got, for hydrogen, two atoms and one valence electron for each of those, so that's a total of two. And then for oxygen, one atom and six valence electrons for that atom, which gives us a total of eight electrons. And then we're going to put, even though hydrogen's the one on the left, it is not the most metallic. And remember, it can't be the central atom. So we're going to put oxygen in the middle, hook hydrogens to it on each side. And we've used four electrons there, four left. And we're going to put those on our central atom. Now remember to do your check. We've used all of our electrons. Does each of my outside atoms have a full octet? Remember the little, it's not an actual octet, but because the hydrogen only needs two to have a full valence uh, shell, we call that a full octet with the little fake quotes around it. Um, and then oxygen has a full octet because it has two shared pairs and two unshared pairs. So two shared, two unshared, and if you remember from our earlier work, that is a shape that is bent. So hopefully you recognize that that is one of the shapes. Remember that those unshared pairs are repelling those pairs of electrons in the bond and pushing them down, making water actually be shaped like this so that they're forcing those hydrogens away and that gives us that bent shape. So water is polar because you can see that that oxygen in the middle is a higher electronegativity. It's pulling those electrons toward it and making it a little bit more negative there. So let's talk about why we care about whether things are polar or not. Things that are polar or have charges can dissolve in things that are polar. So when we talk about things that have charges, hopefully you're thinking, hmm, ions. Those are things that have charges. So things that are polar or ionic compounds can dissolve in things that are polar. Things that are nonpolar dissolve in things that are nonpolar. So we say that like dissolves like. 
Um, polar dissolves polar, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. But things that are different types do not dissolve in each other. So polar things can't dissolve in nonpolar compounds. Nonpolar things can't dissolve in polar, polar compounds. So let's go back to biology and talk about this. You may remember from biology that when we talk about something that's hydrophilic, the hydro means water, philic means it loves water. When we talk about things that are hydrophilic, they're polar. When we talk about things that are hydrophobic, they're water-fearing or nonpolar. And you may remember this gigantic molecule that forms the bilayer for the cell wall. And it's got on the left that polar or water-loving end that faces in towards the center of the cell or out towards the outside of the cell. And then you have the little two long chains that are nonpolar that face into each other. So you have two of these kind of uh, one facing one direction, the other facing the other direction with those two sets of long chains pointing towards each other. And those are the, uh, form that cell wall, that bilayer for the cell wall. So it's really super important. Let's look at how ionic bonds break in water because we've talked about the fact that charged things can dissolve in polar compounds. We know that water is polar. So let's look at how that happens. So here we have sodium chloride being added to water. And we're going to look at what happens on kind of a microscopic level. Water is the solvent, and it means that water molecules can dissolve certain substances. So when you look at that, the negative side of those water molecules is attracted to that positive sodium ion, while the positive side of the water molecule is attracted to the negative chloride ions. And so it allows those molecules, I'm sorry, the molecules of water to separate those ions, the chloride ions and the sodium ions. And then if you look, the water molecules will continue to surround the ions and they form what's called a hydration shell. So there are enough water molecules around them to keep them from bonding again. That's when we say the salt has dissolved. So what happens is polar, water being polar, how it causes those attractions between the water, the partial negative charge on the water and the positive charge of the sodium ions, the partial positive side of the water is attracted to the partial negative of the chloride ions.